So what I'm going to do today is I'm not going to talk about any one specific piece of biology. What I wanted to do was give you an overview of where we are with dementia research and then how um, at Alzheimer's Research UK, where we're a charity focused on medical research but also information um, to the public around what is dementia, what are the treatments available, etc. Talk to you about how we think about the landscape for dementia research and what we're doing to try and get really effective medicines through to patients who are living with a you know, dreadful set of diseases that cause dementia. So as an overview, what I was going to do was really start off with um, a bit of background on how big an issue is dementia, what it is, because I'm aware that some of you are neuroscientists, but some of you aren't, so kind of go through um, the diseases and, and what you would see as a, a patient or a, um, a carer for someone who is a patient. Um, what's actually going on in these diseases in terms of the mechanisms, and if we look at the brains of people with dementia, what can we see? And then go on to talk about the, the challenges in the landscape and what we're trying to do to address those. So dementia is probably our biggest medical challenge of the, the modern era and that's because it is so so common. So globally there are about 47 million people living with dementia uh, and that's going to rise really rapidly and as you can see there on the left hand side 75 million people by 2030 and over well, about 135 million by 2050. And that is largely driven by the fact that as um, across the world, populations are ageing. And the biggest single risk factor for most forms of dementia is age. The older you are, the more likely you are to get it. And if you look at this graph here, you can see that actually the biggest growth in terms of number of patients um, is in low and middle income countries, um, uh, particularly in Asia but also in Africa. Uh, we do have growth in the West, but that is growing at a much slower rate. So with this number of patients, with the diseases being so debilitating, the cost to the global economy is enormous. It will hit a trillion dollars by next year and grow to two trillion by 2030. And that is a combination of direct healthcare costs, a lot of social care costs to look after these people, and a lot of informal care costs, so people giving up their jobs to look after their husband, their wife, their uh, parents. Um, and that has a knock-on effect to the economy of lost productivity. Now, I tried to find some figures in terms of um, the impact in Italy, and there's about 1.2 million people with dementia in Italy. And the cost, I kind of had to calculate using British numbers and scaling by the number of patients, but it's probably around 34 billion euros a year. So this is costing governments, healthcare services, a lot of money. And at the moment, it's the only one of the top 10 diseases identified by the World Health Organization that doesn't have any effective treatment or cure. So what is dementia? So dementia is the umbrella term that describes the symptoms that someone would experience or you would see in somebody else. The most common and the one that certainly the general public are most aware of are cognitive and memory deficits. So problems remembering um, what's just been said in a conversation, where you are, and as the disease gets worse, even who your husband or wife is or who your grandchildren are, you forget those things. The other thing we see, depending on the types of dementia, is problems with decision making and reasoning. So particularly where the frontal part of the brain is uh, involved, uh, you can have a lot of problems in terms of being able to make appropriate decisions. And we can start to see uh, inappropriate behaviours in people as they've lost their inhibitions. So saying very rude or hurtful things about people, uh, making really bad decisions, uh, say around their finances, etc. Um, in some forms of dementia, you have difficulties with cognition, sorry, with communication. So that might be uh, problems actually being able to speak, uh, just from a, a motor point of view. Problems with language use, so choosing the right words or, or being able to remember what certain words mean. Um, and then um, as it progresses, you can get to the point where it's, it's really difficult to communicate with the patient at all. There are various other behavioural changes that you see depending upon the type of um, dementia and they can make it very difficult to manage patients and look after them, particularly where agitation, aggression or depression really, really affect the patient markedly. And all of these different symptoms get worse over time so that eventually the patient's not able to do anything for themselves. 
You very rarely die purely of dementia. You would often die of things like pneumonia, um, various other complications, but they're very much brought on by the fact that you're suffering from really marked dementia. And there's a lot of variability between patients uh, and between different clinical causes. So in terms of the different types of dementia, um, shown in the pie chart is the rough proportions of patients, about two-thirds of whom will have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the next most common is vascular dementia. Um, now that's separate from strokes, uh, but what happens is from a vascular point of view, you generally get leakiness in the vasculature that drives neuronal degeneration and therefore usually quite localised areas of damage. The mixed is shown here at about 10 to 15 percent, although I think as we're doing a lot more research, we're realising that the neat clinical definitions of these different dementias don't really line up with what we can see at a cellular and pathological level. So there's probably a lot more patients with a mixed dementia than we give credit for at the moment. And then there's a number of uh, rarer types of dementia, such as that with Lewy bodies associated with Parkinson's disease and frontotemporal dementia. If you look at the brain of somebody with dementia, in the top I've got uh, a healthy age match control in a coronal section cut across here um, of somebody's brain, uh, post-mortem obviously, um, and um, a late stage Alzheimer's patient, you can all see that this brain is remarkably atrophied, particularly in the temporal lobes here and where the hippocampus should be. And those are the regions of the brain that are involved in recognition, a lot of cognitive function, navigation, and so on. And depending upon the type of dementia you have as to which area of the brain will be showing atrophy. If it's frontal temporal dementia, there'll be a lot of frontal damage, much less so perhaps at the back. In terms of disease course, um, these are diseases that progress over many years. So in Alzheimer's disease, typically from diagnosis to death, your course of disease is around seven years. For frontotemporal dementia, it can be very similar, although there are subtypes that can have a very slow progression, so you might live with the disease for 10 or 20 years. But what we know as you get older is everybody's cognitive function tends to decline a little bit as we get older. Uh, and that's just part of normal ageing. But in these dise diseases, what happens is someone will start to accelerate below or much faster than normal ageing, and their impairment will uh, accelerate, and you'll then start to notice symptoms, initially that clinically we call mild cognitive impairment. So you know there's something wrong in terms of your ability to remember things, uh, your ability to make decisions, etc. But it's not yet clinically classified sufficiently to be called Alzheimer's disease or one of the other dementias. But generally, people with mild cognitive impairment, unless it's caused by some other um, factor, will go on to develop, to develop full-blown dementia. And then that'll get worse and worse until you die. Now, at the moment, the only treatments we have, and these are primarily for Alzheimer's disease, are symptomatic treatments. So when we give these drugs, you get a little bit, and it is a little bit of improvement of your ability, particularly to concentrate and pay attention to something. And that has a benefit in your ability to be able to remember or, or participate in a conversation or a decision. But they don't affect the underlying disease. So you get a brief period of, of benefit, but your disease continues to progress and symptoms will get worse. When I'm talking to the general public, I often say it's a bit like when you're tired. If you have a cup of coffee, then you feel more alert, but you're still tired. Maybe another cup of coffee will work for a while, but eventually the only thing you can really do is go to sleep. Um, so these just have, they pep you up, they do provide benefit to patients, but they're far from ideal in terms of a treatment. And there's two classes of drug available. One is the anticholinesterases. So these just increase the amount of acetylcholine, uh, particularly in the hippocampus, but also in certain areas of the cortex, and improve your attention. And also there's uh, a, a, um, a, a non-competitive glutamate uh, blocker that also has benefit, although we're less clear exactly how that works. That's it. That's all we've got. And actually, if you have one of the many other types of dementia, these don't even work. 
So from a point of view of the patient, this is woefully inadequate. Now what we really want to do, and if you read the newspapers, is do this. Provide a cure where you magically bounce back to where you were. Now as scientists we know that's a pretty difficult ask. By the time you've um, had a lot of neurodegeneration, you've lost a lot of neurons, trying to find some sort of therapy that will repair those, bring them back, wire all the functionality up and restore all those lost memories is going to be a very, very tall ask. Maybe at one point in the future, but for the moment it's unlikely to be the reality. Much more feasible, we hope, although we haven't achieved that yet, is to find a disease-modifying therapy. So something that will slow the disease process down, preferably stop it, so that patients have much um, better quality of life and that their disease is not progressing. And it will give them more time with their family, their friends, uh, in the case of um, elderly patients, perhaps more time to set their affairs in order before they're no longer capable of making those decisions themselves. And of course, if you applied that treatment earlier, then you could hopefully get to a point where it could look like a cure. If you started it back here and it was effective enough, then you'd probably die of something else before the symptoms of dementia uh, became really apparent. So really a disease-modifying therapy is what we're looking for. But of course, to find something that can affect a disease process is generally quite helpful to understand what's going on and causing the disease in the first place. And that's where we have some understanding, but it is far from complete. So if I take you back probably 20, 25 years in the Alzheimer's story, there were really only two things that people talked about with Alzheimer's disease. One was amyloid plaques and the other was tau tangles. So amyloid plaques, so this is a section of uh, human brain stained for amyloid and you can see these large brown inclusions that are extracellular. So this is where the amyloid precursor protein has been processed um, incorrectly to produce an A-beta peptide, about 42 amino acids long, that has, is very prone to aggregation. These aggregates build up and you end up with this hallmark feature of Alzheimer's disease, of particularly your cortex and hippocampus, but eventually pretty much all parts of your brain, apart from your cerebellum, end up just completely full of amyloid plaques. The other um, pathology that you see is tau tangles, not shown desperately clearly here, but what happens is tau starts to aggregate inside your cells, um, and tau is very important for stabilizing microtubules, so it's very important for a whole range of um, cellular functions. It becomes hyperphosphorylated, it starts to aggregate, builds up inside the, um, the neurons, ultimately leading to their death. So 20 odd years ago, it was all about these two proteins and there was an intense debate as to which was most important. I think probably tau has won out in the long run in that the symptoms correlate much more closely with aggregation and accumulation of tau than they do with amyloid. It is possible that you can have an awful lot of amyloid in your brain but very little pathology. Now, I've shown here um, the... the histopathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, but something we've realized much more over the last um, probably 10 to 15 years is actually that a lot of these dementias and the neurodegeneration that is the underlying cause of them are much more, um, have a lot more common features than perhaps we realized. And what I've tried to show here is that spectrum of different disorders which have very, very different clinical uh, symptoms and presentation. But actually, when you look at what's happening, they all rely on one thing, which is a protein aggregating either inside neurons or extracellularly, leading to neuronal damage and then ultimately neuronal death. Now, the proteins that accumulate in these diseases are different, and they're shown across the top here. So, A-beta and tau are classically the ones that you would see in Alzheimer's disease. Whereas TDP43, which some of you will know very well, is seen more in um, ALS and various forms of frontotemporal dementia. Alpha-synuclein is the protein that accumulates in Parkinson's disease in terms of Lewy bodies, I've shown one down here, 
but can also be seen in dementia with Lewy bodies. And I think something we've realized is that in general these are a spectrum of disorders because some of the proteins that accumulate can accumulate in different types of, um, of dementias which have different presentation in terms of symptoms. The other thing we've realized is that actually there's a number of different genes that can underlie a given protein accumulating. So these mechanisms are quite complicated and there is um, different ways of reaching the same endpoint. But ultimately they all result in the same thing, protein aggregation, cell loss, and then clinical symptoms. Um, now that has a big benefit when you're thinking, or potentially a big benefit when you're thinking about therapies. Because if there are some common mechanisms of what causes these proteins to aggregate, what cellular processes do they affect that lead to, first of all, neuronal stress, then damage, then loss, then in terms of trying to come up with drug treatments, we may well be able to find things that affect a fundamental processes and that one drug will affect a multiple different types of, of clinically defined dementias. And that's really important for two reasons. One, if you're unlucky enough to have one of the rarer forms of dementia, a large drug company might not bother trying to find a treatment just for you, so you're going to have to rely on things that are available for other forms of dementia. The other thing is that actually you don't have to rely on your doctor being absolutely correct on getting the right diagnosis. Because if one drug treats multiple different pathologies, then as long as you're in the right kind of ballpark, it should be effective. And it's a little bit like thinking about broad spectrum antibiotics. You don't necessarily need to know exactly which bacteria you've got. You just need to know it's in the right class that this particular type of antibiotic will work. Now, at the moment, of course, we haven't got any drugs to treat any of these diseases, but in terms of thinking about where we're going to, we may well get a lot of benefit from finding something that will work across multiple different types of disease. The other thing that we've understood about how these diseases are, um, develop in the brains is actually what happens is you start to get aggregation in a certain brain region and then it spreads to other brain regions down um, synaptically connected brain regions. Now different proteins have different, um, uh, different patterns of how they um, uh, transmit or they progress through the brain. So if you take Tau, for example, it tends to start in the locus ceruleus. And actually, anybody kind of from my age and upward probably has some tau aggregation in their locus. And it's only when it starts to go to other bits of the brain do you then start this cascade that leads to, um, to a d dementia um, diagnosis. So actually, it spreads out and then around the brain. Um, and the same is true for amyloid. It will spread from one region to another. Uh, same is true for alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's disease and for TDP43. Where it starts and then where it spreads to is different, but there's a typical pattern, at least in most patients. And this has been, first of all, worked out from um, post-mortem brain, looking at different clinical stages and looking at the patterns of uh, deposition. But now, as we have PET ligands, we can also do this in human, uh, living human brain. On the bottom here is an amyloid PET ligand, and as disease progresses, you can see that there's a lot more amyloid deposited in these people's brains. And in tau, you can see it spreads from the entorhinal cortex through the hippocampus and more broadly in the temporal cortex before spreading uh, further across the brain. And as we get more data, as more people are scanned and for different types of dementia, this pattern is slowly, very clearly emerging from um, the different scanning techniques that we have. And this, I think, will be very, well, it's important now for diagnosis and if you're trying to run clinical trials so that you know exactly what type of pathology your patient has, and this may well be uh, important in the future when we have um, licensed medicines in terms of working out which patients get which uh, treatments. Although, of course, PET scans are cheap and, and far from kind of simple as a patient, so better ways of diagnosing and really typing the types of um, dementia and pathology someone has would certainly make it a lot easier for medical practice. 
The other important point I want to make about how these diseases progress is the time course. So somebody would go to their doctor definitely once they've got dementia, they may well go when they've got mild cognitive impairment. But from a range of different scanning techniques, we've, we've kind of managed to put together the disease course of what's happening to different aspects within these diseases. So this is for Alzheimer's disease, and it's the most well worked out. But for other diseases, we see similar patterns. So the line on the far left is the, um, the amyloid deposition line. And you can see that this starts well before you get to either mild cognitive impairment or to dementia. And this time window here is about 20 years. So amyloid is accumulating long, long before you see any obvious symptoms. And for reasons that we don't fully understand, this then seems to start a domino effect of other pathologies that start to build up that lead to you having symptoms. So the next thing that we can see, and this was demonstrated using FDG PET, so looking at glucose usage across the brain, is you can start to see that that decreases in Alzheimer's, particularly in the temporal lobes. Um, and then you start to see tau accumulating you can then start to see atrophy using MRI, so you can actually see brain shrinkage. And then ultimately, you start to see cognition going down, and then your ability to function decreasing. So you've got a cascade of events happening over a couple of decades. So what we're doing when we diagnose somebody with dementia is really diagnosing an end-stage disease. If this was cancer, this would be the point when your cancer has metastasized all over your body, right? Whereas what we need to be doing is thinking much further back. Because if you're trying to start a treatment, at the moment, we've been trying to treat these patients. So far, we've had zero success in the clinic trying to modulate, for example, amyloid or tau at this stage of the disease. And that's perhaps not surprising. Amyloid reached its maximum point 15 years ago. Um, all sorts of other things have happened since then. So the disease pathology is probably no longer dependent on the amyloid levels at this stage of disease. Now, for practical reasons, we're now running clinical trials at this stage because we can find these people. They've got a mild cognitive impairment. If you look for them through memory clinics, um, through various other kind of medical um, medical care systems, you can find patients at this early stage and therefore you can enrol them in clinical trials. There are a whole load of those going on at the moment and we hope that at least some of those are going to work. But what you really need to do is get all the way back here and that's really challenging because these people are healthy so they're not going to come into the doctor and say in 20 years time I'm going to have dementia, can I enrol in a clinical trial now? Very few people will do that so how are we going to find them? we're going to have to find ways to diagnose much, much earlier than we do at the moment. Now, as we understand more about these diseases, it will help us do that. But this is one of the key challenges in this area, is trying to treat the patient at the right time. And an analogy I often use when talking to the general public is thinking about cholesterol levels. So we know that high cholesterol gives you a much higher chance of getting a heart attack, stroke, and a whole range of other cardiovascular disorders. So what we do these days when you're 30, 40, 50, if you go to the doctor, you may well have a cholesterol test. If it's high, you'd be advised to take exercise, improve your diet, but you're probably given a statin to lower your cholesterol. And there's not technically anything wrong with you at that point. High cholesterol by itself is not a disease necessarily. But we know the very strong um, linkage through to later issues around cardiovascular health. And therefore, we treat early. That's probably where we need to get to with Alzheimer's disease and other disorders, where we can spot this happening and start treating to try and prevent that domino effect of other pathologies that leads to neuronal loss and symptoms. So in terms of what do we understand about these uh, processes, well, genetics has been incredibly helpful. So if we go back to the late 80s and early 90s, with the technology we had available at the time, we could find autosomal dominantly um, inherited forms of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. 
And in Alzheimer's, that led us to, to the amyloid uh, cascade hypothesis because three genes were found to come out very strongly in early onset autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, where the onset of disease was usually in your 40s or 50s as opposed to your 70s or 80s uh, as it is for sporadic disease. Um, amyloid precursor protein is the protein that a beta it comes from, and presenilin 1 and 2 are two of the enzymes that chop up APP. So it was a very nice, clear story. And you know, that has been very important for driving research for the last 20 years. We also understood that um, APOE gene was also very important, and it comes in three forms. The APOE3 form is um, kind of the, the, the normal version that has that about 75% of the population carry. About 25% um, have uh, an E4 allele, or a very small number have two E4 alleles, and that uh, increases their risk of developing Alzheimer's disease markedly. If you look in Alzheimer's disease populations, about 70% of them will have at least one uh, APOE4 allele. So that is one way in which we can hope for, uh, we can find people early. We can see if they carry this gene. But it doesn't mean to say you definitely get Alzheimer's. You're just at a much higher risk. Now, as genetic um, uh, technology advanced, we got cheaper to be able to sequence. As the size of cohorts grew from ten, you know, individual families to hundreds, then thousands, then hundreds of thousands, the GWAS studies have identified a whole load of risk genes where they just increase your risk a small amount. But what these do is you start to put them together, you start to understand different pathways that these genes lie on that help you to understand what mechanisms might be driving these pathologies. And the other important thing is, we've also found some protective alleles. So all of these are increasing your risk. But we've also found that APOE2, the other form of the APOE gene, actually reduces your risk. There is a point mutation in APP that actually tends to, re well, reduces its ability to be processed into A beta that is protective. That was found in an Icelandic population. And then just this summer, um, a... Um, a P, P, um, PLC gamma 2 mutation was found that is also protective. So this gives us some insights of how we might uh, target um, different genes from a therapy point of view uh, in terms of trying to mimic protective alleles. And then obviously the risk genes help us to understand what might be driving the disease. And really there's kind of four areas that um, that come out. Lipid metabolism, I guess the APOE was the early indicator of this, but many other genes point in that direction. A clear role for the vasculature and the neurovascular unit in terms of um, potentially uh, exacerbating pathology. A very clear role for uh, the immune system, either beneficially or to actually drive um, pathology, particularly microglial activation. And then also deficits in proteostasis. So, of course, all the neurons we have in our brain are the same neurons that you, know, you had when you were a young adult all the way through life. And those cells are much more susceptible to any changes in protein synthesis, quality control, degradation processes than much of the rest of your body where the cells are turned over, over, um, over your, well, much quicker than your lifetime. So, these are kind of four key areas that we're looking at in terms of pathology. And um, I'll just pick out two. In, with microglia, they are resident in your brain as your resident kind of immune cells. And their job is really to survey the environment, and they have a whole range of functions. But phagocytosis of waste products is a key one. And if these cells get aberrantly activated, then they can drive inflammation First of all, um, having effects on um, uh, spine uh, pruning, so pruning your dendritic spines, and then can start to impair synapse function and ultimately lead to neurodegeneration. And then on the proteostasis side of things, it's really important when we make transcribed proteins that they get properly folded and used. And what happens if they are misfolded or um, 
the incorrect post-translational post modifications is you, you can end up with oligomers, so small aggregates forming, that then go on to be these large aggregates like the plaques you saw earlier. And of course the, the cells have systems to deal with this in terms of something called the unfolded protein response, the ability for the proteasome to clear proteins, or for larger um, kind of uh, disposal processes, autophagy in terms of actually encapsulating whatever it is you're trying to get rid of, whether it's a protein aggregate or whether it's um, uh, subcellular vesicles and so on, to then ultimately fuse with the lysosome and destroy them. And anything that affects these processes will affect your homeostatic capabilities of your neurons, and these are particularly vulnerable versus many other cell types. And I'll just very quickly um, point you towards, if you're interested, a really good review by Bart Stroop and Eric Caron last year, which really highlights that for the first 20 years, we probably spent far too much time thinking about the biochemistry of these disorders and measuring the clinical uh, part of, of the, the, um, the ultimate expression of what happens. And not enough time in the middle here of what he's called the cellular phase. So what's actually going on with the neurovascular unit, the role of microglia in there, as well as thinking about things like uh, lipid metabolism and proteostatic mechanisms. Now, obviously, I could speak for days on different, um, different elements and really drill down to the biology of this. But I'm going to leave that there and move on to a broader kind of landscape piece of if this is, these are diseases and this is what we're trying to sort out, what can we do about it? So, in terms of what are the gaps in the dementia landscape, because as a charity we try and think about well, what are the issues when you look broadly across the field and then what can we do about them? Well, we have a relatively poor understanding uh, as, as the general public in terms of, uh, or engagement, with these diseases. And that's perhaps not surprising because they're diseases of old age and there's nothing we can do about them at the moment. So the public don't tend to engage with this as a, um, as a disease, perhaps as, as much as they do with, say, cancer um, or other uh, cardiovascular disease, for example. We haven't got any new therapies, and we don't have anything that can affect the disease course. And we diagnose late. So those are kind of some of the key issues. Now, what might be causing those? Well, dementia is highly stigmatized. People don't like to talk about it, which means they struggle to engage with this as an issue because nobody talks about it. And there's a sense of fatalism that it's an inevitable part of aging. Well, if it's inevitable, it's going to happen anyway. Why would you engage with it? Why would you try and do something about it? Because it's going to happen. Which means that not only at the general public level, but also to a certain extent at the government and political level, there hasn't been enough engagement and enough funding going into this area. And as researchers, you'll all understand that without funding, you don't do any research. Therefore, you don't understand the disease. Therefore, you don't know what to do about trying to treat it. So you have that kind of cascade of problems. Because we don't know much about these diseases, because we haven't invested in understanding them in the same way as we have, say, cancer, then we've had a very high failure rate as companies have tried to develop uh, treatments based on you know, limited information. And companies are businesses at the end of the day. They look at what is their return on their investment. If you put lots of money in, you get nothing out. That doesn't encourage you to keep putting in lots of money. So as companies, many pharmaceutical companies have pulled out of this area because it's seen to be too high risk, too expensive, it takes too long. And therefore, that is a self-fulfilling prophecy of not being able to get through to treatments. So we've got to try and solve some of these problems as a charity, and what are we doing about it? Well, the first thing that's important is increased political focus. If politically something wants to get done, it usually starts to move in that direction. And you saw the figures at the beginning. Once politicians realise it's costing them a fortune, then they start to think about, well, is there ways of trying to reduce this cost, partly for society benefit, partly because they've got to make the books uh, add up. So, what's been happening? So David Cameron, one of the better things he did as a Prime Minister, um, was one of the first Prime Ministers to really engage with this, and he launched a Prime Minister's Challenge in the UK that channeled various pieces of funding and changes to healthcare operation into the dementia field. 
and he held in December of 2013, he used his presidency of the G8 to hold a summit purely on dementia. So this brought some of the big, biggest political powers in the world together to try and do something about these disorders. And they committed to this goal of trying to find a cure or disease-modifying treatment by 2025. So they gave themselves 12 years when they started on this. And then you may have seen in the news just this week, Bill Gates here has decided that he's going to start investing some of his money philanthropically into this area. He's made a £50 million investment earlier this week. And if you read the news coverage, it's clear that that's the first of different things he wants to start doing. So this area is starting to attract a lot more political interest that's driving more funding and other mechanisms that will help. The other thing is public awareness. If you look at what happened in cancer or HIV, where we now have pretty good treatments, a key thing is getting the population mobilised. If there's an outcry that something is not happening, it is much easier to drive politicians, businesses and various other um, mechanisms in the right direction to getting more funding. But to do that, you have to have people understand what's going on and then care about it and want to do something about it. And one of the things that we've discovered through surveys is only, you can't read that very well, 23%, so one in four people in the UK actually understand that dementia is caused by diseases. It's not an inevitable part of ageing. So one of the things we've done is, hopefully this is going to work, is do some uh, public education videos. And this is about a minute and a half, and I'll just show it to you. Like many of you, I've witnessed the devastating effects of dementia. But because many people think dementia is just a natural part of ageing, they don't realise that it's something that we could one day defeat. To help change that, I'm asking you to do one little thing on behalf of Alzheimer's Research UK. Just share this film about an orange. You see, the truth is, dementia is actually caused by diseases, just like cancer or AIDS. Alzheimer's disease is the biggest cause of dementia. It physically attacks your brain, gradually destroying it, piece by piece by piece, until it strips away everything that makes you, you, and then you die. In fact, the brain of a person with Alzheimer's is so damaged it weighs 140 grams less than a healthy brain. That's about the weight of an orange. While scary, this does prove it's a physical disease and not just part of aging. Research has beaten diseases in the past. And with your help, research can defeat dementia. So please, just share the orange. It's an example of um uh, one of the short videos we've put out to try and help raise public awareness that then also helps us as a charity raise more money that we can then put into research. Now I'll take a short aside in terms of drug discovery in um, Alzheimer's disease. And I don't know how familiar you are with the challenges of drug discovery, but essentially you start with some information that's usually come from academic sources in terms of what's causing these diseases, what might be a good uh, target. You try and find a compound that you can take into clinical trials to actually affect that disease process. You run a, a range of phase, uh, phase one, two and three clinical trials to see if it's safe and it works. If it does, you ask the regulators to approve it and then you've got a medicine. So that's nice and quick. It just takes 15 years and probably a billion dollars. Um, now the challenge in dementia dis drug discovery is we don't understand enough about the diseases so we can't pick our targets very well. And the clinical trials are really long and expensive because um, we're probably picking patients too late at the moment and the progression of the disease is relatively uneven between different patients and our clinical tools for determining just how bad somebody is are relatively blunt. So you need large trials run over a long period to see if it works. That means it's expensive. So, Sadly, nothing's made it to the end yet, apart from those symptomatic treatments. 
And this is evident if you look at the pipeline of number of agents. So this is phase two, the first time you test if something actually works in patients. And then phase three is where you confirm it in larger groups of patients. Now, you might look at this and think 80 agents is good. But if you compare it to cancer, it's more than 1,000. And if I, this is for Alzheimer's disease. If I put this up for frontal temporal dementia, there'll be one or two limping along. That'd be it. So this is a really poorly underinvested area, and we clearly need to boost the amount of um, drug discovery work that's going on, because ultimately the more attempts you have at it, then the more likely you are to reach the end. So as a charity, one of the things that we are very much thinking, well, to just come down to the bottom here, we've got four areas of research. Understanding the disease is obviously very important. I'm going to talk about developing treatments, but we also do work in terms of understanding how people can reduce their risk and also improving diagnosis. So if we're trying to increase the amount of dementia um, R&D, well, first of all, you need that basic understanding of what the hell's going on. So you can do that through academic grants, and we also have an investment in something called the Dementia Research Institute that I'll touch on in a minute. And we've got three different mechanisms for trying to drive more drug discovery in this area. And the way I think about them is whether it's us working directly with pharma, as we do in the Dementia Consortium, us partnering directly with academia to drive drug discovery, or us being part of something that's industry-led in a more venture capital investment way. The Dementia Consortium that Marco works on is, has the goal of basically increasing the number of validated targets. And what I mean by this is that the biology is robust. You can find one or more compounds that are potent, and selective at whatever it is you want them to do, inhibiting an enzyme, um, you know, increasing act uh, signaling through a receptor or whatever. So you've got a compound that does what you want it to do and doesn't do too much else. And you've shown in cell models and in animal models that it, it has an effect that's consistent with efficacy. There's no major safety reasons as to why it shouldn't go forwards. And then you're in a much better position to find the molecule that you'll take into clinical trials. And what we've been doing is we've built a consortium with these five drug companies, plus LifeArc, which was, was called the Medical Research Council Technology Arm. And LifeArc bring the drug discovery expertise in terms of actually doing the laboratory work. The academic partners who apply to the Dementia Consortium, like Marco, bring the knowledge of the disease and often reagents uh, and other things that can get the project started. And then... At ARUK, we bring funding, along with the pharma partners, plus expertise on thinking about how to run a drug discovery project. What are the key experiments you need to do? What are the questions that you need to answer? And we have a portfolio of different projects. Um, these are the projects here. Actually, the, the project that runs out of, uh, out of here is actually the only one that doesn't have any companies attached to it. And that's because they perceived that TDP43 was perhaps only involved in a subset of, of dementias, perhaps not commercially attractive enough. Plus, I think because this is an anti-aggregation approach, but they saw that there was more risk to this project, so they decided not to do it. But we thought that it was a very important project to do, and actually, I think it's the one that's making the best progress. Um, and what these projects are is we have a number of milestones, which really the first milestone is around the feasibility of getting the assays set up and, and checking that you can actually do a project, essentially. The second milestone is finding good compounds that we can take into milestone three, which is where we are then trying to see if it has an effect in a whole animal, usually, and in more sophisticated cell models. And what you can see is that we work globally on the Dementia Consortium. So we have uh, three projects in the UK, but we've also got um, some in, uh, in Spain, in Luxembourg, and in Italy, and then we've got one over in the States. Now, the Drug Discovery Alliance that we set up is trying to achieve the same thing, but through a different model. So what we've done is rather than rely on academics bringing applications to us and then trying to pick which ones we want to work on, we've embedded a group of scientists within three different universities, Cambridge, Oxford, and University College London. 
There's about 22, 23 people in each of those three sites, a mixture of biologists and chemists, and they're working with initially their local academics for the most tractable, most interesting types of biology that are in their labs, working very closely with them to take those ideas and start translating them through to early stage drug discovery and hopefully validation of a target preclinically. And then the idea is you would then work with industrial partners who would take that further into clinical development. So um, these are the three leaders. This is often called the boy band photo. Um, so we've got John, John and Paul working in three universities. And the important thing is these guys have industry experience, as do their heads of biology and chemistry. So these guys know what the customer, which will be a, a drug company, what a good package of data looks like and how to do drug discovery. Because it's a different type of science to academic um, discovery science. So these guys work very closely with the academic teams. Uh, in Cambridge, David Rubenstein, a world expert on autophagy, is our key contact. Um, in Oxford, Simon Lovestone, who's done a lot on fluid biomarkers, but also big data. And Chaz Bountra, who founded the uh, Structural Genomics um, Consortium, are our Oxford partners. And then in UCL, John Hardy, who's kind of the godfather of the um, amyloid hypothesis, along with particularly Bart de Strooper, who is a very good um, gamma secretase uh, biochemist in Alzheimer's disease. They drive forward the portfolio. Now this is the portfolio. I haven't given you specific targets, but what I've done is identify the areas that we're working, the areas of biology. Now this is where we started about a year ago. And over the last year, a good number of projects have moved forward. But you'll also notice there's three with red crosses. And that's because we couldn't replicate what was in the literature. Or, in the case of this project at the bottom, the assay was so variable that we weren't going to be able to run it on an ongoing basis to find compounds and refine them. It's just going to be too difficult. So we just stopped that project for feasibility reasons. And an early indicator for me that this is a successful model is out of these 17 projects, 10 of them already have some sort of pharma partnering where they're providing us with compounds we can screen or other forms of reagent. So they're keen to see us move these projects forward to this uh, end stage of the portfolio where that hopefully we can then pass those over to them to develop further into a medicine for patients. The final model is the Dementia Discovery Fund. So this is a venture capital fund that operates in the same way that all venture capital funds are. So they think carefully about what to invest in, what will be their return on investment if the project gets to this stage or this stage or this stage. But the key difference is you can only spend the money on dementia. Because typically venture capitalists don't like investing in this area because it's more expensive, it's more risky and it takes longer to get your money back. So by forming that around dementia, we can now channel VC money into this area and boost the, the number of small companies working in this space. And this was set up through David Cameron's Prime Ministerial Challenge. So the Department of Health put the first £15 million in. Then this range of drug companies uh, put the next kind of 80 or 90 million in. Woodford, who is a classic VC um, house, Neil Woodford, they've recently joined. And from Monday, Bill Gates has just put down an extra 50 million. So now they've got about 150 million pounds to invest across the dementia space. And actually, there's two or three other big investors potentially coming in that would push this north of 200 million pounds. And this is an example of the companies they've got. And what you can see, a bit like our Drug Discovery Alliance portfolio, they're looking at different areas of biology, uh, trying to find those mechanisms that will be really effective. Finally, the, um, the UK Dementia Research Institute has £150 million of British government money channeled through the Medical Research Council with a further £50 million from ourselves and the other UK Alzheimer's charity, Alzheimer's Society. It's across six universities in the UK, with UCL being the main centre. And we've already awarded about £55 million worth of grants for the next five years. And we're aiming to have about 400 scientists altogether. It's led by Bart de Strooper. Um, he he uh, was the director we selected. And then these other uh, folks here are key leaders um, in different areas of biology. Chris in front of Temple Dementia. Julie's done an awful lot of um, dementia genetics. 
Giles is a really good synaptic physiologist and, and electrophysiologist. Giovanna has done a lot of work in terms of the unfolded protein response. And then on the end here, Paul Matthews is a big imaging guy. So together, we're trying to leverage the best across the UK with a big slug of funding to really boost what we can understand in these diseases. And if you then try and put it all together and think at the landscape level, going from an idea through to early drug discovery, through to clinical trials and a medicine, then Alzheimer's Research UK can affect at the early stages in academic research, translating this through in different ways to ultimately the pharmaceutical companies, who are the only people that can really afford to do these clinical trials and get to a medicine, and then at the advocacy and public engagement end, we come back in again in terms of pushing the government to make sure that once these drugs are approved, that they can get access to them and that cost is not a barrier for patients getting treatments. So finally, in terms of where we are, we're trying to raise that public awareness to create that movement that people really want to solve this problem, which drives investment and all sorts of other things in the right direction. We're trying to understand more about these diseases, both at the academic end of really understanding the biology and then translating that through to new treatments. And that's all I was going to say, and I, I've probably just got time to show you one more video, which is another um, public awareness video we put out last Christmas. Once upon a time, in a town not too far from here, a little girl named Freya was preparing for Christmas. But Christmas wasn't quite as magical as it used to be. Someone was missing, tucked away, and forgotten. Freya asked her dad, who is this? So her dad began to tell her the story, the story of Santa Claus. How one Christmas Eve, things started to go wrong. He began to mix up presents and muddle names. He seemed sad, distant, and afraid. Year by year, things got steadily worse, until finally, he stopped coming altogether. But Freya didn't want to believe the story ended there. So she set off on a journey with an idea of how to help, because she believed something could be done. Freya gathered the elves around and showed them that maybe, if a broken mechanism could be mended, then so could Santa. The elves now had a new purpose, one that would take all their commitment and determination, because if Santa had a disease, research could find a way I believe in you. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. It can affect anyone, but everyone can play a part in fighting back. This Christmas, only research has the power to change the future. Text BELIEVE to 70755 to donate five pounds to Alzheimer's Research UK. Right, thank you very much. Any questions?